This morning we're talking about what it means to be blessed. And, and as we're singing this last song, it, it made me think, like, to be blessed, someone who is blessed is, is the same heart. If you, if you recognize that you're blessed, you can sing, you are good. It's an understanding of who God is and what he's done. So we've just finished up a sermon series on joy. Joy is an awareness of God's grace. Joy is more than emotion. It, it's being aware of what God has done for us. And so this morning, what we're going to talk about relates to that. We're going to be looking at the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes is just a word that means the blessings. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5. So if you want to turn there in your Bible now, we'll, we'll get there in a minute. But Matthew chapter 5. But before I, I, I jump into these blessings... Or, or what it means to be blessed, we have to understand a little bit of what's going on in the book of Matthew. Matthew is one of Jesus' disciples. He, was, he had been, previously been a tax collector, and now he's come to faith in Jesus. And he writes one of the books, the Gospels, the, the story of Jesus that we have. And so Matthew is telling the story of Jesus, and he tells about the birth of Jesus and the Magi coming to see Jesus. And then we don't have much for a lot of years through Jesus' life till he's around 30 or so, we think. And then the story picks up again. And where the story picks up is, is Jesus goes out to the Jordan River from, from where he is, and he finds John the Baptist, who is a cousin of his, and he's baptized by John. And it's strange because we think, why would Jesus need to be baptized? We, we, baptize, we get baptized to identify ourselves with Jesus. Why would Jesus need to be baptized. We'll figure that out someday. I'm not going to talk about it this morning. Then immediately it says, Jesus is led by the Spirit, not, not by the devil. Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Also not going to talk about that this morning. There's a lot there, but we're not, we're not getting there. So Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. And so he comes back he doesn't give in to the temptations that, that Satan gives him. He comes back into to the area where he's from, Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee in Nazareth. And he calls his first disciples. And he says, would you come follow me? It, it's, the, it's the invitation of a rabbi, of a teacher to students or learners. And so he calls these first disciples. And then he begins traveling around and teaching. So in the moment, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, says this. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, as somebody who preaches, I pay particular attention to that verse because it says this is what Jesus began to preach. So if I'm preaching about Jesus, I should probably pay attention to what he's preaching about. And what does it say that he's preaching about? The kingdom of heaven. And then in a couple verses later in 423, Matthew tells us that Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues. Again, he's teaching. He's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of heaven and he's healing every disease and sickness among the people. And then at the very end of chapter 4, it says, People are coming from everywhere. As far away as Syria. It's, it's far away. I don't know how far quite, but it's far away. People are coming from a long ways away to hear Jesus. And, and it says that there are sick and there are demon-possessed. And there are all, those with all kinds of diseases and there are people from Syria, which means they're outside, they're Gentiles, they're not a part of the people of God. They're all coming to hear Jesus. And this is where it becomes really important to understand these summaries of what Jesus is doing. Matthew Matthew summarizes all that Jesus preaches by saying he began to preach, repent for the kingdom has come near. And he summarizes all that Jesus does by saying he's, he's healing people and he's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. It is show and tell for Jesus. He is telling the people about the good news of the kingdom and then he's showing them, thanks guys, he's showing them what that means. It's, Jesus is, is demonstrating and proclaiming the kingdom of God. And Matthew summarizes all that Jesus does 
by having it be about the kingdom. And so now we're going to, here's the, here's how being blessed relates to joy. Matthew is talking about the kingdom and Jesus is announcing the kingdom. And if Jesus is proclaiming and teaching about the kingdom, how do we bring about the kingdom? We don't. And so to be blessed means that we understand that the kingdom has come to us. Just as joy is not just happiness, joy is being aware of what God has done for us, the grace that he's given us. So I'm, I love that we get to talk about these two things back to back. So with that background now, I want to jump into Matthew 5, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Last week we looked at 40 verses. Today we're just going to look at four, thankfully. I would, it would take forever. If you would, please stand. If you're able, stand as, uh, and follow along as I read the, the passage for this morning. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Would you pray with me? God, as we, as we look at your word this morning, as we look at what it means for us to be blessed, God, I pray that you would help us to have an understanding of the blessing that you give us, and I pray that you would help us to have an understanding that the kingdom indeed has come near to us. Would you guide us, Lord, by your spirit? We ask these things in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. <clears throat> so when Jesus sees the crowds, he goes up on a mountainside and he sits down. And his disciples come to him and he begins to teach them. Now, it's Matthew Matthew really highlights the fact that Jesus is a teacher, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But one of the first things that I think is really important for us to pay attention to in this passage is who is the audience. And there's, there's debate if you start studying this passage and reading about this passage. If you read uh, Bible scholars about this passage, there's some debate as to who Jesus is really talking to. Some people say that these disciples have gathered around him. So Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's announcing the kingdom and he's about to give this sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. This is just the beginning of it. It's the longest chunk of Jesus' teaching that we have in scripture. And so People think that this teaching, Jesus is, a, he, he's at, he is operating as a rabbi and he has disciples who are students. And so he's teaching these disciples. But there's crowds all around. At the end of chapter 4, it says there's crowds, people from everywhere. And at the beginning of 1, it says, now Jesus sees the crowds. He goes up on a mountainside. I'm a, assuming because there's a nice grassy spot to sit down. And he, he goes and he teaches them. So who is he speaking to? Is he speaking to the disciples or is he speaking to the crowds? And my answer is yes. Yes. You see, if I, I, I'm preaching right now, I could have five of you come up here. And if I have five of you come up here and I'm talking to five of you, does that mean the rest of you don't hear it? Does it mean it doesn't apply to the rest of you? See, what I think Jesus is doing is it, it applies to the disciples in a very immediate and real way, in a way that it might not apply to everyone else yet. But that doesn't mean that tomorrow or the next day or next month, the very things that he's saying to them won't apply to the crowds. And in fact, what he's about to say carries extreme relevance and importance for the crowds. So it's both. Like I said, Matthew, being a teacher is really important for Matthew. And here's one of the ways that we know that that's true. Jesus goes up on the mountainside and he sits down. Rabbis would sit down in order to teach their disciples. So what Matthew is indicating for his, for his readers is that Jesus is taking on the role, Jesus is taking on the posture of a teacher, of a rabbi, and so he sits and the people around him know that he's just sat down that means that what he's about to say is important. Now, here is the problem. We tend to diminish people of all kinds. 
no matter what you think about Jesus and no matter how you view scripture, most of us at one point or another will diminish the teaching or will lessen the teaching or ignore the teaching of Jesus. But Matthew is highlighting that Jesus is in fact a teacher and he's a really good teacher. We'll see that throughout the gospels. But the other thing that Matthew highlights is that this is about a kingdom. And kingdoms have what? Kings. And so Jesus is not only the teacher, he's the king. And if the king is teaching you about the kingdom and you're not obeying what the king says, then what you're saying is not my king. And that becomes a problem for us when we disobey Jesus as teacher because we're not just obeying the teacher, we're disobeying the king. And so Matthew wants to make sure that we understand, one, that Jesus is teaching, but we have to also understand, two, that he's not just a teacher. He's also king. There's two more subtle ways that Matthew highlights the importance of what Jesus is doing. Depending on what translation of the Bible you have, verse 2 might look different. His disciples came to him, verse 2, and he began to teach. That, fra that sentence literally in Greek says, and having opened his mouth, he taught them. Now, when we translate that in English, we're like, of he was speaking, of course he opened his mouth. That's kind of, we don't need to put that in there. So it's taken out. The problem with that is this. That's a Greek way of saying that somebody really important is about to say something really important. It's a Greek phrase that would be used. It says, and then he opened his mouth. So uh, an example would be, and then Caesar opened his mouth and declared. And when Caesar does that, it's somebody who's really important saying something that's really important because when he says it, it becomes law or decree. And so it's important for us to understand that what Matthew is telling us is that there's somebody really important about to say something really important and weighty. And then the second subtle way that we miss here uh, is, I don't, this is kind of nerdy, but it uh, has to do with the verb. And the verb is in an imperfect tense. And all that really means is this. In, imperfect verb tenses mean that something is repeated or continuous or habitual. So somebody that's really, is, really important is opening their mouth to say something that's really important. And then he taught them in a continual and repeated and habitual way. Meaning that one, one thing that I read this week says we could, we could translate this, this is what he used to teach them. In other words, this isn't just something that Jesus said once. We have it recorded but these are the things that Jesus would continue to teach the people that would gather around him. That's really important because it helps us to understand the weight and it helps us to understand that Jesus would continue to teach these things about his kingdom. Now we can jump into the actual beatitude part of, of the story and not just the summary. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. This passage, these, these Beatitudes get uh, misused and mistranslated often because we simply don't understand the context behind them. And this word blessed is one of those things. You see, Jesus is a Jewish man. It may come as a surprise to some of you. Some of you are up to speed on that. And Jesus, as a Jewish man, would have known Hebrew. That's the language of the Jewish people. And in Hebrew, and there's a, there's a dialect of Hebrew, Aramaic. I believe that's, it's a dialect of Hebrew. I have to double check that. But that's what Jesus probably spoke or what Jesus did speak, Aramaic. In Aramaic and in Hebrew, this word is not just blessed. This is an exclamation. And so we see this in the Bible, and sometimes it's actually translated more as an exclamation or a proclamation. Like in Deuteronomy, we find this phrase, Oh, how blessed are you, Israel, saved by the Lord, your shield. It's an exclamation of what is. Or we find it in Psalms 1 and Psalm 2. Blessed is the person that walks in the counsel of the Lord, or blessed, or oh, how blessed are those who put their trust in the Lord. This isn't just a statement of fact. This is a proclamation of what is. I can tell you 
that Michigan State is ranked right now number one. That's a statement of fact. Or I can say Michigan State is the best basketball team in the country. Do you see the difference? One is a proclamation or a declaration. One is a simple statement. That's what's happening in a much more real way, in a much more important way, in the Beatitudes. Blessed. Oh, how blessed. Oh, how blessed are the poor in spirit. It's a declaration of what is. It's a proclamation of the reality of something. Another important piece to understand in English, we translate this blessed are. That verb are is not there in Greek. It's assumed, but it's not there. So it would read literally, oh, how blessed, or oh, the blessedness of the poor in spirit. And that's important because we tend to look at the Beatitudes and think the blessing is because of the condition that is named next. But that's not it. We'll, get, we'll come back to this in a moment. So, oh, how blessed the poor in spirit they're not blessed because they're in poor in spirit. They're blessed in spite of the fact that they're poor in spirit. And this is the heart of the gospel. This is why this is such good news that Jesus is proclaiming. It's not just news, it's good news. And this is why it's good news. Even the poor in spirit are welcomed into the kingdom. Even those who have nothing, are welcomed into the kingdom. It comes in spite of our earning it. It comes in spite of our deserving it. And in fact, even when we don't deserve it, the kingdom through Jesus comes to us. That's good news. Now, let's not forget who is listening to Jesus, whether he's teaching the disciples or the crowds. Let's not remember, or let's not forget who's listening. The sick, the poor, the demon-possessed, the lame, those with all sorts of illnesses are coming to Jesus. Now you have to understand something about the way that people thought about the sick, the poor, the lame, and the demon-possessed in Jesus' time. If you were poor, it meant you didn't have God's favor, and that's why you were poor. If you were sick, it meant that there was sin in your life, and God didn't give his favor to you, and so that's why you were sick. We see this play out in the Bible. Jesus, a blind man comes to Jesus, and the Pharisees say to Jesus, who sinned, him or his parents? They just assume that something has been done wrong by this man. And so that's the reason that he's blind. That's the reason that God's favor is taken away from him. And so Jesus shows up and he says, oh, how blessed are the poor in spirit because the kingdom belongs to them. This is good news. And so when we see Jesus making these beatitudes, one of the things that we're tempted to do is just make them rules. So is Jesus saying that in order to be blessed, you have to be poor in spirit? No. Jesus is saying that the kingdom has come even to the poor in spirit. As we go throughout these beatitudes, to, to be poor in spirit is just a condition, but we're going to get to others. Things like blessed are the merciful or blessed are the peacemakers. And it's important for us to understand this now, and this is why I'm taking time on this today. It's important for us to understand that Jesus isn't just turning this into new rules. Jesus is saying that the kingdom is here, and that's why you're blessed. Don't turn the Beatitudes into a list of things that you have to do in order to receive God's blessing. Because when we get to things like merciful and peacemakers, we're going to be really tempted. Those are things to do. And we're going to be really tempted to say, these are the things that I have to do in order to be blessed. And that's not what Jesus is saying because Jesus isn't teaching just a new form of legalism. Jesus is teaching the kingdom. And when the kingdom comes, you recognize the king. And when you recognize the king and his character and quality, and you want to live into that kingdom, and you want to take part in that kingdom, you begin to demonstrate that character and quality. And so that's what it means to be merciful and a peacemaker and to hunger and thirst after righteousness, you recognize that that's the character and quality of the king and you want that in your own life as well. And that blessing comes not because you did anything, but because Jesus brings the kingdom. 
It's so important that we remember that as we go. We don't bring about the kingdom. Excuse me, Pastor Peter and I, I put happy up there with a question mark because Pastor Peter and I, uh, we kicked around the idea of, of titling this sermon series, Happy, uh, one afternoon in the office. Because some translation, this, the word that's, the Greek word, blessed, can be translated happy. Not, it's not very often, but it can be happy. Uh, and I even read the, uh, in Greek, the island of Cyprus is called the happy isle. But it's this word, the same as blessed. Because Cyprus is this exotic island and everything needed for life exists within Cyprus. And so, uh, and, and if you're there, you don't want to leave. Um, the exact opposite of like right here, right now. You just want to get out of here as fast as possible. <clears throat> Here's the thing. When we, and if you recognize that the kingdom has come to you in spite of your deserving it, in spite of your ability to earn it, the kingdom has come to you. It's just God's good gifts to us. The kingdom has come to me and I want to live into that kingdom. I want, I want to follow that king. I want to follow his teaching. I want to be part of that kingdom. Is it going to change your mood? Probably. And so I'm okay with us saying happy, but let's understand. The, the only reason that I'm, I, I kind of hesitate from using it is the word happy in English, the root word is hap. And we see it used in words like haphazard or uh, happenstance. It means by chance. So this, be, recognizing that you're part of the kingdom, the kingdom is made available to you, it may make you happy and it probably should make you happy. But it is by no means by chance. Jesus became flesh and lived among us so that we would recognize the king. And that wasn't chance. He did it because he loves you. He did it because he loves us. He did it because he wants the good news to continue to spread throughout the world. That wasn't by chance. So the kingdom comes to us because of Jesus, not because of anything we've done. And it's not by chance. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. The word that's used here for poor is the lowest word that can be used for poor. It means literally nothing. <clears throat> one of the things that happens in the in the um, one of the things that happens in the Gospels is sometimes things get recorded by two different people, and they're kind of the same, but not quite the same. And that's happened with the beatitude. Beatitudes. Luke records the Beatitudes, or a version of the Beatitudes as well. And Luke says, blessed are the poor. There's no in spirit. It's just the poor. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the, I don't remember exactly how Luke finishes. And so people, there's this disagreement. Who is Jesus talking about that is blessed? Does it mean those who have, have literally have no material possessions? And so this is, this is a way of, of, of helping us to see that social justice and, and taking care of people's physical needs is important. And then Matthew, we have Matthew who says poor in spirit. And that's, we look at that more of as an attitude or, or the condition of our heart. And so which is it? And the answer again is yes. Why do we have to separate them? We were talking about this. I was talking about this with Tony last week. If something happens and he describes what happened and I describe what happened, are they going to be exactly the same? No. Does that mean that he's lying? No. Does it mean that I'm lying? No. It means that different people, something stood out to them in a different way. So is it possible that Jesus means the, the materially poor and those with poor attitudes or conditions of their heart? Is that possible? Yes. And in fact, when we look at the crowds who are around Jesus, does it mean both? Yes. Yes. Those who are materially have nothing and those who know that they are spiritual zeros. My favorite summary of what, of what poor in spirit that I read this week was spiritual zeros. Like these are the people, like if you're going to start picking teams like kingdom of God teams and bad guy teams, these are the people who are picked last because you don't want them on your team. They are spiritual zeros. They have no, like, if you're going to start a church, you don't want them on your team. If you're going to go about ministering, you don't want them on your team. And Jesus says, oh, how blessed the spiritual zeros. Because they're spiritual zeros? No. 
the blessing has come to them. They're not somehow blessed because they're spiritually destitute. Being spiritually destitute doesn't bring about the kingdom. The kingdom comes and we can join in. And when we join in the kingdom, we change. And so this is the other way that you'll see the interpretation of poor in spirit go. When we change things, our, our hearts and our attitudes become different. Like I said, this word poor is the lowest word that you can use to describe being poor. And it means literally, the word means literally to cower or to, to, to cover yourself or be bent over like a beggar. That's why I have the picture of these hands here. This is what it means to be poor in spirit. I have nothing. Might it mean money? Yes. Might it mean the attitude of my heart? I have nothing. Yes. It means both. To be poor in spirit <clears throat> means that we have this attitude that I am helpless without God's help. I have nothing without God's help. It means that if not for the kingdom, I have nothing. If not for the kingdom coming to me, I, I'm, I'm, I have nothing. No, no amount of money, no amount of anything changes me without the kingdom. The best illustration of this is Jesus sees a, a tax collector and a Pharisee come into the temple and the Pharisee says, God, thank you, God, that I'm not blind. You'll notice if you read this story that he says, thank you for these things. And he lists these things. All people that are assumed just don't have God's favor. And the Pharisee is thanking God for them because he's not a spiritual zero. And then a tax collector comes in, somebody who's hated, and he beats his chest and he says, have mercy on me, a sinner, Lord. That's the summary of what this means to be poor in spirit. It's going to be very important for us. We're only going to look at the Beatitudes in this sermon series. This Beatitudes, as I said earlier, are the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. As you go through the Sermon on the Mount, it becomes, it becomes very helpful for us to, to view this first beatitude as a grounding point, something to come back to, because as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, the, the teacher king, is going to say things like, if you look at a brother and sister or sister with anger in your heart, he doesn't even say if you act on the anger. He doesn't say if you yell and scream and say, I'm sorry. He says, if you just look at them with anger in your heart, you are in danger of judgment. And then he says silly things like, if you look at somebody else lustfully, you're in danger of judgment. And then, get, this is ridiculous. He says, pray for your enemies. I don't even pray for people I like. A lot of times. Pray for your enemies. Now, if those are the kinds of things that this teacher and king is teaching us, when we look at ourselves, we should quickly recognize this is the standard that Jesus gives us. These are the kingdom standards that he gives us. If I think that I am spiritually superior to anyone else, I am sadly mistaken. All that we can do when we recognize what it means to be poor in spirit, all that we can do is stand before Jesus grateful that he doesn't wait for me to deserve the kingdom. All we can do is stand before Jesus being grateful that he doesn't make me earn it first. All that we can do is stand before Jesus amazed that he's come to us and brought the kingdom with him. Last thing I'll say about this one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Oh, how blessed the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The four, that's the because. The word can literally also be translated because. Blessed 
are the poor in spirit. Because they're poor in spirit? No, because the kingdom belongs to them. The kingdom is available to them. They can live into the kingdom just as well as anyone else. Blessed, oh how blessed, the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. We can tend to spiritualize this one as well. We can say, oh, this means those who mourn their own sin and their own, their own failures, those who can mourn the fact that they are, are not good in and of themselves. Blessed are those, that's what it means to mourn. Jesus didn't qualify it. So I think we should be really careful when we qualify it. This mourning, the, the word that's used for mourning is, is what you do when someone dies. It's what you do when you've experienced extreme loss. Jesus says, oh, how blessed those who mourn. What? That doesn't make sense, Jesus. How can we mourn and be blessed those who are grieving, the kingdom is for them as well. Spiritual zeros can be part of the kingdom. And those who are mourning recognize that the kingdom is theirs as well. And they will be comforted. We'll, we'll get to the comfort in just a second. See, the good news of the kingdom is good news. And so to be even when we're mourning, it means that we can have deep joy. Deep joy and deep sadness can reside in the same heart. There's an, I read this week, there's an Arab proverb. And the Arab proverb says, all sunshine makes a desert. In other words, if it never rains, stuff doesn't grow, right? It's easy to see why that's an Arab proverb. We don't have deserts like Arab people do. All sunshine makes a desert. Sometimes you need rain in order for things to grow. Sometimes the things that cause the deepest sorrow in us are some of the most valuable things in our life, the things that we could be most thankful for. Deep joy and deep sadness can exist in the same heart. Now, I thought about this in my own life. The worst two years of my life the, the, two, the two years that I was most stressed, the two years where I was most anxious, the two years that I wanted to throw in the towel the most and quit, whatever I was doing, it didn't matter what it was, I just wanted to quit. Those two years, I look back and they, those two years, I learned more in those two years than the rest of my life combined maybe. It was incredibly powerful and if we're gonna assign value to a, a time span, those two years were the most valuable years in my life because this is what the kingdom does for us. It can teach us even in the midst of deep sorrow and pain, but it's only when we recognize that the kingdom is with us. I almost thought that this was different from the rest of the Beatitudes for a moment as I was studying this week, because, oh, how blessed those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And I, I began to think that, oh, we're, we're just supposed to feel better. But it's so much deeper than that. Blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. And the word that's used is a Greek word, parakaleo. Parakaleo is a, it's actually a legal term. It means a legal advocate, but here's, here's why. It means close beside and to call out. It's two words kind of combined. It means close beside and to call out. It, this is a word that's talking about someone that is up close and personal to you. It's a personal word. It's not a, it's not a word that's divorced from, from personal connection. Not only is this a word that describes someone that's up close and personal, this is the word that Jesus use, used for the Holy Spirit when he's teaching his disciples. He said, I'm about to leave, but the parakaleo, the paraclete, is going to come to you up close and personal. 
This isn't just Jesus telling us, oh, you're going to feel better. This is Jesus telling us, I am always going to be with you. This is Jesus telling us, there's nothing that you can do to get away from my love for you. This, there's nothing that you can do to separate yourself from me once you enter into my kingdom. There's nothing that you can do. There's nowhere you can go that I won't be with you. This is what Jesus is telling us. And this is very much has to do with the kingdom. All of these things that Jesus is going to tell us in the, the, the kingdom, in the Beatitudes. Oh, how blessed are because of a kingdom reality. And the kingdom reality is that he's with us. He's a comforter and he's close up and he's personal. It's going to be important for us to remember as we go forward that these, the Beatitudes are not simply new ways to be right before Jesus. These are about God's blessing. <clears throat> I was reading a book by a guy by the name of Dallas Willard, and he says, the Beatitudes are not recommended ways to earn God's favor. So we have to remember that the, the Beatitudes are not recommended ways to earn God's favor. And then this is what he says. They're explanations and illustrations drawn from the immediate setting of the present available availability of the kingdom through personal relationship to Jesus. We have a teacher and we have a king. And he came to be with us and he came to teach us about what it means to live into that kingdom. And when he comes, the kingdom comes with him and it's available to everyone. Those who are sick, those who are poor, those who are spiritual zeros, those who were previously outside of the people of God, Jesus says, oh, how blessed. Because the kingdom belongs to them as well. This is how I want to finish this morning. I simply have two questions for you. And these are questions that I want you to continue to, to keep in mind as we go forward with the Beatitudes. The first question is, what does it mean to be blessed? What does it mean to be blessed? If you ask me what it means to be blessed, I'll usually, the first thing that come to my mind are things like, oh, I have a nice, nice enough house, decent car, 2.3 kids, and sometimes my water works. Sometimes it doesn't. It's, that's pretty good. That's, that's what it means to be blessed. But when you answer this question, I want you to think about what does Jesus say it is to be blessed. And then ask yourself this, because, why? What is the source of the blessing? Is it because of particular attitude that you have or is it something else? What is the reason that Jesus says people are blessed? So this week, I want you to ask yourself those two questions. What is it to be blessed? And, and think about what Jesus says it is to be blessed, not just what you think it is to be blessed. And second, what, what, for what reason or what is the source of the blessing? There are going to be people at the back to pray with you this morning like normal. And, and this is maybe you don't recognize that you've been blessed. Maybe you don't recognize that the kingdom has come to you and it's available to you. Or maybe you've been ignoring some of the things that Jesus is teaching us as king and his teacher, and they simply want to pray with you and help you to see the kingdom and what it means to be blessed. Oh, how blessed the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, how blessed those who mourn, because they will be comforted up close and personal. Would you pray with me? God, we are tempted to think that we, um, we need to do something in order to earn your blessing. I pray that you would help us to see that your kingdom has come to us. It wasn't just, it wasn't just as Jesus walked the earth, and it's not just some other time when you change things completely and fully and finally but Lord, your kingdom is here now and we get to live into it and we get to be a part of it. And because your kingdom has arrived, we 
are blessed. God, I pray that you would keep us from turning this teaching into just uh, uh, new rules to follow. Lord, will you help us to see your goodness? Lord, would you help us to realize that, that without you, we have nothing? Would you help us to realize that even in the midst of deep pain, you are with us? Lord, may our hearts truly be able to cry out, you are good. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, because yours is the kingdom, and yours is the power, and the glory belongs to you and you alone. It's in Christ's name that we pray.